WTVR's All Night Fright is only a play. We repeat, this is only a play. WTVR now presents H.G. Wells' classic, War of the Worlds. A special report from WTVR News. At 20 minutes before 10 o'clock Central Standard Time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory in Chicago, Illinois, has reported several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. He tells us the gas is hydrogen and it seems to be moving off the planet at a tremendous velocity. Professor Pearson of Princeton confirms Farrell's report. Pe uh, Pearson also believes that the hydrogen gas is in direct line with their own planet. This has been a special bulletin from WTVR News. In alphabetical order, tonight's cast includes J. August, John Howard, Tom Ogburn, Doug Riddell, and Ron Savage. Again, we repeat, this is only a play. Following up on our WTVR special report giving only a moment ago, Washington has requested the large observatories of the country to keep a watch on any further disturbances on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual occurrence, WTVR News has arranged an interview with a noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. In a moment, we'll take you to the Princeton Observatory in Princeton, New Jersey. Until then, this has been a special bulletin from WTVR News. Originally, War of the Worlds was done in the fall of 1938 on a New York radio program called the Mercury Theater. It was only intended to be a Halloween prank. Oddly, the broadcast caused mass hysteria throughout New York and New Jersey. Again, we repeat, this is only a play. We are ready now to take you to the Princeton Observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, this is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton. I'm standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong split in the ceiling. Through this opening I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a sort of thoughtful glow of the intricacies of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is a, the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform looking through the giant lenses. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise in our interview. <coughs> Besides its continual watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or, or other communications. During this period, he's in constant touch with other astronomical centers of the world. Uh, Professor, uh, may we begin our question? Uh, anytime, Mr. Phillips. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. Uh, it's a red disk swimming in a blue sea, some darker stripes across the disk. Quite clear now, because Mars has to be at the point nearest the Earth, <laughs> in opposition, we call it. Well, in your opinion, uh, what do these darker stripes mean, Professor Pearson? <laughs> Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips, although that's the popular idea for those people who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions uh, peculiar to the planet. Well, then you're quite sure as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it kind of just couldn't exist on Mars. I'd say the chances for life are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the planet's surface? Mr. Phillips, I, I cannot account for that. Professor, by the way, for our listeners, how far is the planet Mars from Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. Uh, pardon me, Professor. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody has handed Professor Pearson the message. While he reads it, let me remind you we're talking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we're speaking to the world-famous astronomer, Professor Richard Pearson. One moment, please. The professor is answering a message that he's just received. Uh, professor, Professor, yes, yes. May, I, may I read the message to the listening audience? Uh, certainly, Mr. Phillips. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray from Natural History Museum in New York. Quote, at 9.16 Eastern Standard Time, the lab registered a shock wave of almost earthquake intensity occurring in the radius of 20 miles just outside of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Professor Lloyd Gray, Natural History Museum, New York. Uh, Professor Pearson. Could this possibly have something to do with the disruptions on the surface of the planet Mars? Uh, hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we will conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, for the past 10 minutes, we've been speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, bringing you a special WTVR interview with Professor Richard Pearson. This is Carl Phillips for WTVR News. Thank, uh, thank you, Carl. Before we return to our regular programming, here's another special report. Toronto, Canada, Professor Morris of Macmillan University has reported seeing three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports from American observatories. And now nearer to home, here's a report from Trenton, New Jersey. At 10.50 p.m., a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover Mills, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible in a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. This has been a special report from WTVR News. WTVR 1380, Request Radio. WTVR, gonna set the night on fire. In reference to our last WTVR bulletin through the facilities of our sister station in Trenton, New Jersey, WTNJ, a mobile unit with Carl Phillips has gone to the scene where the flaming object believed to be a meteorite fell. We take you now to Grover Mills, New Jersey. Carl, are you there? <clears throat> Thank you. This, this is Carl Phillips for WTNJ and WTVR. We're, out to, we're outside of the Wilbur Farm in Grover Mills, New Jersey, with Professor Pearson and 11 other scientists. Well, I, I hardly know where to begin. I'll, I'll try to give you a word picture of what's going on before my very eyes. It's something out of the twilight zone. I, I just got here. I haven't had a real chance to look around. I, I, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, yes, there's the thing directly in front of me, half, half buried in the deep pit. Must have hit with terrific force. The, the ground's covered with splinters of a tree that it hit on the way down. But I can see that the object itself doesn't have, doesn't look like much like a meteor, at least not the meteors I've seen. Looks more like a huge cylinder. It has the length of, uh, well, what would you say, Professor Pierce? Uh, what's that? The, the length, the length of the object. Uh, approximately 45 yards. About, about 45 yards. And up around the front, well, I've, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of a yellowish white. Curious spectators are, are pressing in close to the object, despite the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're getting in uh, my line of vision. Would you mind standing? Please, would you, would you mind standing uh, one side, please? Uh, here's, here's Mr. Wilbur, the owner of the farm. Uh, he may have some interesting facts. Mr. Wilbur, will you please tell the radio audience how, uh, well, as much as you remember, the rather, rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard. Uh, step, step closer, please. Uh? La ladies and gentlemen, here's Mr. Wilbur. Uh, well, I was listening to the radio. Talk louder, please. What? Uh, would you talk louder, please? Y yes, well, I was listening to the radio and kind of dozing off, and this professor feller was talking about Mars. And I was sort of so sitting what, there what half happened? dreaming. What, well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio, kind of halfway... Yes, Mr. Wilbur, and uh, you saw something. Well, not, not first off. Now, first off, I heard something. Yes, Mr. Wilbur, what did you hear? Well, it was a hissing sound, kind of like a, a 4th of July rocket. Well, th then what? Then what? Well, I stuck my head out the window, and I swore I was sleeping, you know, dreaming. Yes, yes, and, and, uh... Well, I'd seen a kind of greenish streak, and zingo, something smacked the ground. It sort of knocked me to the floor. Well, were you, were you frightened, Mr. Wilbur? Well, I ain't quite sure. I, I guess I was more irritated. Oh, thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Thank you, thank you very much. You, you uh, want me to tell no, all no, about no, that? No, that, that's, that's all right. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've, you've just heard Mr. Wilbur, owner of the farm where this, this thing is falling. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the, the background of the fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in the field. In fact, the police have tried to block off the roadway leading into town, but it, it's no use. They're, they're breaking right through. Cars' headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the object's laying. Some of the more daring observers are trying to go towards the edge. One man wants to touch the thing. He's, he's having an argument with a policeman. <laughs> now, now the policeman went. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, there, there's something I haven't mentioned at all, this excitement. It's, it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already in your wicket. Listen, please. Do you hear it? An odd humming, a sound that seems to be coming from the inside of the object. I'll move the uh, move the mic closer. Can you can you can you hear it now? We're not more than twenty-five feet away. Uh, Professor Pearson. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Phillips. 
Can you tell us the meaning of the, the, the scraping noise in, inside of this thing? Um, possibly the unequaled cooling of the surface. I see. Do, do you think it's uh, a media professor? I don't know what a thing, Mr. Phillips. The uh, metal casing is definitely unknown to me, something not found on, on, on this Earth. The, the Earth's atmosphere will tear a hole in a meteor. And as you can see, this is just... Just, a... just, just, just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, something's happening. This is terrific. The end of this thing is, is beginning to flake off. The top's beginning to rotate like a screw. The thing must be, must be hollow. This is... Wait a minute. So, someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Someone or something I see crawling out of the black hole. Two illuminated discs. Might be the eyes. It might be the face. Might be almost anything. Something now wiggling out of the shadow like a great snake. There's another one. Another one. And another one. I can see the body now. It's black. It glistens like leather, white leather. It's awful. I can't keep looking at it. It's awful. Its eyes are black. The, ha the hands are whatever large snake things, and its, its mouth is V-shaped. Some sort of liquid dripping from its rimless lips that seems to quiver and pulsate. <laughs> the monster, whatever it is, can hardly move. It seems to be weighted, uh, weighted down by something. Possibly gravity or something. The, the thing's rising up now. The crowd's falling back. I'm, I'm not sure what I can do. I better take a new, go to a new area. I'll be, I'll be back in a moment. Uh, from WTVR News, uh, we are being uh, bringing you an eyewitness account of. Uh, uh, what is happening at the uh, Wilbur Farm in Grover Mills, New Jersey? It, it'll be just a moment. Uh, we, we're trying to reconnect our uh, 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 line to Carl Phillips. If you if you'll stand by, please. Uh, have we got? Yes, we've we've gotten back to call. We uh, we we now return you to Carl Phillips of uh, WTNJ at Grover Mills. Glad that. Uh, oh my, I'm on. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm here behind the stone wall in the field at Wilbur's farm. From here, I can get a sweep of the whole thing. I'll, I'll give you every detail as long as I'm able to talk and as long as I can see. More state police have arrived, and they're, they're drawing the crowd away from the pit, about, about, about 30 of them. There's no need to tell the crowd to get back, though. They, they prefer to keep their distance. The captain's trying to call somebody. I, I can't see who. Oh, yes, it's, it's Professor Pearson. Yes, yes, it is. Now the professor moves around to one side, studying the object, while the two policemen are on either side, giving him a hand. I see what they're doing. It's a, it's a white piece of cloth tied to a pole, a flag of peace. Flag of flag of truce. Those creatures know what that means. If they know that means anything. Wait! Something's happening. Thin metal poles rising out of the pit. That's out on a small beam of light across the mirror. The light's turning into flame. They're directing the flame towards the men. Piece of fire is streaking out across the field. Across the field. Oh! A man's burning! Oh my God! The flame's setting fire to the automobiles. The field! It's everything! It's coming this way now. It's about 20 yards off my... <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, we have lost transmission with Carl Phillips at Grover Mills. We will return to the location as soon as possible. This broadcast is coming to you through our sister station, WTNJ, in Trenton, New Jersey. In the meantime, another bulletin has come to the WTVR newsroom, San Diego, California. Dr. Englander, speaking at a dinner for the California Astronomical Society, has expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are nothing more than extreme volcanic action. We continue now with another musical interlude. WTVR 1380, Request Radio. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been informed that we've established communication with an eyewitness to the tragedy. We've set up a direct line at a small farmhouse just outside Grover Mills with Professor Pearson. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of what has happened at the Wilbur Farm. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Richard Pearson. Um, of the creatures in the rocket cylinder in Grover Mills, I, I can give you no authoritative information either to their nature, their origin, or their purpose here on Earth. Of the destructive instrument, uh, I might venture some ideas of my own as to explanation. Uh, for one of a better term, I'll refer to their weapon as, as a heat ray, laser in quality. It's also obvious that these creatures have a knowledge far advanced of our own. It is my guess that in some way they are able to generate a beam of intense heat in a chamber of practically non-conductivity, uh, much like our own laser beam, but theirs is like a blowtorch in relation to a match. This, this intense heat they project in a straight, thin line against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, Professor Pearson. And here is another WTVR report from Trenton, New Jersey. It's a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. Now, now here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. The Office of the National Director of the Red Cross reports that 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia stationed outside of Grover Mills, New Jersey. And here's another report from the state police outside of Princeton. The fire or uh, fires at Grover Mills and that area are under control. It seems to be quiet at the pit, and there does not seem to be any sign of life coming from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonnell, vice president in charge of operations. We have received a request from the state militia at Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the tragedy of the situation, and believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities at Trenton. Uh, we take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover Mills, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps attached to the state militia, now involved in military operations in the area of Grover Mills. The situation arising at present of certain individuals on an identified nature is now under control. The cylinder object which lies in a pit directly below our position is surrounded on all sides by armed units of infantry without heavy field pieces, but they're armed adequately with rifles and machine guns. Uh, all cause for alarm, if that cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. The things, whoever they are, don't s seem to want to venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here. With all their reported resources, well, these creatures can barely stand up against our heavy machine gun fire. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out their cotton uniforms crossing back and forth in front of the light. Looks almost like a real war. There appears to be some light smoke in the millstone woods bordering the river. Probably a fire started by some campers. Well, we ought to see some action soon now. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank. Quick brush and it'll all be over. Oh, wait a minute, I, I see something on top of the cylinder. Uh, no, no, it's nothing but a shadow, I think. Uh, now the troops are on the edge of the Wilbur farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on the all-metal tube. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, wait, that wasn't a shadow. That, that was something moving. It, 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 it appears to be metal, solid metal, sort of a steel-like affair. R rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. Wait! It's standing on legs, actually rearing up. Sort of, sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees. The searchlights are on it. Hold on! Hold on!
This is just... Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the facts that our eyes see lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings that landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are a vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle that took place tonight has ended in one of the most startling defeats of any army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with machine guns pitted against one single fire machine from the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest of the men are scattered over Grover Mills to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster or burned to a cinder by the heat ray. The monster is now in control of the middle of New Jersey, cutting the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and discontinued, except routing some of the trains through Allentown or Phoenixville. All traffic has been stopped. Most of the highways are jammed with cars. We take you now to Washington, D.C. for a message from the Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to hide the gravity of the situation that now confronts our country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, the urgent need of calm action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is confined to a small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. Placing our faith in God, we must continue to perform our duties, each and every one of us. I thank you. This is Army Bomber Plane B-833 off Bayon, New Jersey. Lieutenant Bolt reporting to Commander Fairfax, Langdon Field. This is Bolt reporting to Commander Fairfax at Langdon Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight, reinforced by three machines from the Morristown Cylinder. Six are all together. One machine is partly crippled, believed to be hit by shell from Army gun. The guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme density nature unknown, no sign of heat ray, enemy now turning east, crossing the Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Evident objective is New York City. They're pushing down a high tension power station. The machines are close together now, and we're ready to attack. Planes are circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards will be over the first. 800 yards. 600 yards, 400 yards, 200. There they go, giant arm rays, a green flash. They're spraying us with those flames. 2,000 feet, engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs. There's, a, there's only one thing left to do, drop on them, plane and all. We're driving on the first one. Now, now the engine's gone. Hey. This is Bayonne, New Jersey. Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langdon Field. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langdon Field. Come in, please. This is Langdon. Go ahead. A Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. One machine destroyed. All enemy bombers lost. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in the direction of... This is New York, New Jersey. This is New York, New Jersey. Warning. Heavy poisonous black smoke coming from the Jersey Marsh. Earth population moving to open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over Raymond F. Ah, uh, QXQL calling CQ. QXQL calling CQ. Uh, this is QXQL calling CQ. QXQL calling XR3R, come in, please. This is XR3R, coming back to QXL. Uh, how's the reception? How reception? Okay, please. 
Uh, where are you, uh, 8X3R? Well, what's the matter? Where are you? I'm speaking from the roof of the broadcasting building. I'm speaking on the roof of the broadcasting building in New York City. The bell you hear is to warn the people as the Martians approach to leave the city. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the road to the north. The parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed 10 minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Our defense is wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here until the end. People are, are holding services here below us in, in the church. And now I look down the harbor, all manner of boats pulling away from the docks, overloaded with a fleeing population. Streets are all jammed, noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in the city. Wait a minute. The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five, five great machines. The first one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, waiting, waiting the Hudson like a man waiting a brook. Bulletin, Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One in Philadelphia, one in Baltimore, one in San Francisco, one in Chicago. They seem to be timed and spaced. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. It's steelhead even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers in the city's west side. Now they're shifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out. Black smoke <laughs> drifting over the city. People in the street see it now. They're, they're running toward the East River. Thousands of them dropping like rats. Now the smoke is spreading faster. <coughs> it reaches Times Square. People try to run away from it, but it's no use. They're, they're falling like flies. <coughs> the smoke is now crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. It's hundreds of yards away. <coughs> QXQR calling CQ. QXQR calling CQ. QXQR calling CQ New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? As I set down these notes on paper, I'm obsessed with the thought that I may be the last living man on Earth. I've been hiding in this empty house near Grover Mills, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke of the rest of the world. All that's happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures all seems part of another life, a life that has no continuity with the present. A futile existence for the lonely man who pencils these words in the back of some astronomical notes bearing the name of Professor Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, my... And I try to connect them with the professor who lived at Princeton. And on the night of October 20th, gazed through his telescope at an orange flash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... My world, where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is this? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands to wind the clocks? Writing down my daily life, I, I tell myself that I will preserve human history between the dark covers of a book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But, but to write I must live, to live I must eat. I find molded bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. I keep watch at the window. From time to time I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. The smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but, but at length I hear a hissing sound and, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine spraying the air with steam as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. 
Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. It's morning. Morning. Sun streams through the window. Black clouds of gas have, have lifted, and the scorched meadows to the north look like a black snowstorm has passed them. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road. No traffic. Every once in a while, I, I see an overturned car, scattered baggage, a, a blackened skeleton. I push north. Somehow I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. And I keep a careful watch. I've seen Martians feed. If one of their machines should appear over the trees, I'm ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October. Yes, I, I must be right. I fill my pockets and keep a watch. Two days I wander in a, in a vague northerly direction through, through a deadly world. Finally, I notice a living creature, a, a small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him in wonder, and he stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion, the, the joy of finding another living being. I push on north. I find death, cars with burnt bodies, I, and beyond the charred ruins of a dairy, a silo in a black field standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse without a sea. Next day I come to a city, a city vaguely familiar in its contours, but a city dwarfed it as if a giant hand has leveled off the tallest buildings with one swoop of a hand. I reached the outskirts and found Newark. Newark, undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians, Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I saw something crouch in the doorway. I made a step toward it, and it rose up and became a man, a man armed with a large knife. Hey, where are you from? I come from many places, a long time ago from Princeton. Princeton, huh? That's near uh, Grover's Mills. Yeah. Grover's Mills. Uh, there's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town, down to the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I, I guess I'm looking for people. Who was that? Did you hear something just then? No, only a bird. A live bird. <laughs> you get to know that even birds have shadows these days. Hey, say, we're, we're in the open here. Let's, let's crawl in the doorway and talk. Have you seen any Martians? No, they're... They've gone over to New York. At night, the sky's alive with their lights. It's almost like people are still living. In the daylight, you can't see them. Five days ago, some of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I <laughs> think they're learning to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. All over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. Yeah. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars fall on everywhere, every night. They've only, they've only lost one machine. <laughs> if there's anything left, we're done, we're licked. What about you? you? You're in uniform. Yeah, well, what's left of it? I was in the militia, National Guard, you know. <laughs> there wasn't any war, any more than there's war between men and ants. Yes, but we're eatable ants, I found that out. What'll they do to us? Oh, I figured it all out to, you see, if, they're, if we're caught. They want us. A Martian has only to go a few miles and get a crowd on the run. No, they won't do that. They'll keep going. Pretty soon they'll start catching us with a system, storing us away, keeping the best ones in cages and things. They, they haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Nope, not begun. All that's happened so far is because we don't know how to keep quiet, bothering them with guns and stuff, losing our heads, running around in crowds. No, instead of rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. You know, fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. You know, cities, nations, and civilizations. Yes, but if, if so, what is there to live for? Well, they won't be any more concerts for a million years or so, so nice little restaurants. <laughs> if it's amusements you're after, I guess your game's up. What is there left? Life, that's what. I want to live. And so do you. Then we're not going to be exterminated. And I don't need to be caught either. Tamed, bred, fattened like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on, right under their feet. <laughs> I got a plan. 
See, we men, as men, don't know enough. We've got to learn to think. We've got to learn to live while we learn, you see. Mm. We don't know enough. I got it all figured out. But what are the risks? Well, it ain't that all of us were made to be beast. Now, I can't help everybody. You know, take, for example, these little office workers who used to live in these houses. You know, they're no good. Ain't got no stuff in them. Always afraid. Afraid they get canned, running back at night. Afraid they wouldn't be in time for supper. Lives insured, a little invested in case of an accident. Always worrying about the, the hereafter. A Martian would be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. Yeah, after a week of chasing around the field on empty stomachs, they'll come around <laughs> and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? You bet I have. That isn't all. These Martians are going to make pets out of us, train them to do tricks. Who knows? Get sentimental over a pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. Yeah. <laughs> and some, maybe... They'll train to hunt us. No, no, that's impossible. Well, yes, they will. There are men who'd do it gladly. In the meantime, where are you and I and others like us to live when the Martians own the Earth? I've got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers under New York City. Miles and miles of them. And they're big enough for anybody. And there's more. Underground storeroom, railroads, subway tunnels. You're beginning to see, huh? We'll get a bunch of strong men together. No weak ones. That rubbish out. As you meant me to go. Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? I won't argue that. Go on. Well, we got to get some safe places to stay in, see? Get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, you see. We'll raid the museums. We'll even spy on the Martians. May not be much. We have to learn. Well, just imagine this. Four or five of their own machines starting up. Heat rays, right and left. Not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, you see. But men. Men who've learned the way how. May even be in our time. <laughs> Gee, imagine one of those things with its heat ray riding free. We turn it on the Martians. And we turn it on men. We bring everybody down on their knees. That's your plan? Yeah. You, me, a few more of us. I see. Uh, we'd own the world. Mm. What's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Bye, stranger. After parting with the man, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel, entering that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I left the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I made my way up 14th Street. And there again was the black powder, several bodies, and an evil odor. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s and stood alone on Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of brown meat in his jaws, a pack of mongrels at his heels. He made a wide circle around me as if I might prove to be a fresh competitor. I walked up Broadway and in that direction of the strange black powder, past silent shop windows displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. I looked up at the General Motors building, watching a flock of black birds circling the sky. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea. I rushed over Columbus Circle and into the park. I, I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street, and from there I could see standing in a silent row along the mall. I could see 19 of those great metal giants, their towers empty, their steel arms hanging down without life. I looked in vain for the monsters that had given those machines their life. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to a large flock of black birds that hovered directly above me. They circled to the ground. And there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians letting the birds peck and tear large strips of brown flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by small bacteria, something their systems could not handle. Strange, after all man's defenses had failed. From the humblest thing that God in his wisdom put upon this earth came the Martian's death. 
Now sitting in my study again at Princeton, writing down this last chapter as a record that had begun in Grover Mills. Strange to look out my window and see the university sky, blue, a spring day. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young couples strolling on the new green spring grass. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum to watch the remains of a Martian machine that is kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright, clean-cut, hard and silent. Under the dawn of that last great day. This program has been recorded. We hope you enjoyed our play. It was WTVR's way of saying trick or treat. Our cast included Harry Arthur, John Howard, Tom Ogburn, Doug Riddell, Ron Savage, and yours truly, Jay August. Again, we hope you enjoyed our Halloween present to you. WTVR! in the lab.